to all storytellers and story lovers. My name is Laksh Tata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here. English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second. And tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app. Welcome back to the Darbar Hall at the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol. Our session today is presented by our official magazine partner, The Week. Will China shape the future of the world? Rana Mittar in conversation with Tan Sen Sen. Was the relationship between China and the world shaped by wars? War with Japan in the late 1930s, the PRC's involvement in Korea in the early 1950s, its border conflict with India in 1962 and the military offensive it launched against Vietnam in 1978 were key events in the history of China's foreign relations. Within this context, how will the relationship between the two rising powers, China and India, and the global leadership of the United States change during the 2020s? As China develops its Belt and Road Initiative, how will it influence the future of Asia and the world? Rana Mittar, author of China's Good War, explores how China's new nationalism might structure its relationship with India, the United States and the world, in conversation with Tan Sen Sen. Rana Mittar is director of the China Center at the University of Oxford. His book, China's War with Japan, 1937 to 1945, The Struggle for Survival, was a book of the year for The Economist and Financial Times. His newest book is China's Good War, How War is Shaping a New Nationalism. Tan Sin Sen is Professor of History, the Director of the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai and Global Network Professor at NYU. His most recent book is Beyond Pan-Asianism, Connecting China and India, 1840s, 1960s, that he co-edited with Brian Sui. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present, Will China Shape the Future of the World? Rana Mittar in conversation with Tan Sen Sen. Over to you, Tan Sen. Great. Uh, hello, Rana. Uh, nice to have this conversation with you. Uh, and we decided, for those of you in the audience, that instead of me asking all the questions to Rana, we'll have a conversation in which he would also ask me questions. Uh, and basically, you can join in uh, around 35 minutes from now. Uh, and before we get to answer the crucial question that is a the theme of, of today's uh, conversation, uh, I would ask Rana to just talk to us about how he got interested uh, in Chinese studies, uh, Chinese his history in particular, uh, and what his experience has been uh, with regard to studying China. Thanks very much, uh, Tansen. Great to be able to speak, speak to you this morning from actually a very sunny Oxford, England. And I can see the afternoon sky behind you in Shanghai, while plenty of people listening to us in India and around the world. Even in the time of pandemic, truly technology is an astonishing thing. And I think China is a rather relevant answer to part of your question. If we turn from the wonders of technology, the strange kind of globalization that we've moved into, and the role of the world's biggest rising power. So, I have to say that if I were a smart person, then I would say that, oh, well, you know, 30 years ago, I could see what was coming. I could see that this, you know, huge Eastern superpowers are rising, but I saw nothing of the sort. That's completely the wrong answer to the question. The right answer to the question is that way back when I was in high school, so, you know, in my late teens, I was very interested in trying to tackle a language. I was very into languages at that time. And I think you know this yourself from your own experience, Tansen. And I thought, you know, what was the most kind of distant language? What was the least connected language I could think of from anything that I knew, in my case, growing up in the south of, of the UK? Um, and I have to say, at that point, China seemed to be very much uh, the answer to that question, partly because actually, if you were a smart person, and you would think you're taking a bet on, the, the, on East Asia in those days, Japan, not China, was the country that was going to be coming and taking over the world. You know, talking about the late 80s, early 90s. And of course, Japan remains a tremendously important cultural influence. But at that time, China was kind of slightly the, 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 the eccentric choice, the, the choice that was slightly outside the mainstream. And I have to, have to say, having started to learn the language at university, 
and then getting into the history. And again, I know that's something you have a really you know, strong connection with, Tansen. Um, and then finding that actually, even more than with many other countries, knowing the history and understanding where it is in the present and the future are so closely entwined. Well, that combination seemed to me a very, very attractive one. So that, that was what sort of pulled me in in the, in, 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 in the first place. I should just ask you, Tansen, I mean, you have this amazing grasp of India and China over the very long trajectory uh, through a whole variety of lenses. I don't think I've ever asked you, I'm going to ask you now, what brought you first to China as part of your, your, your studies? Sure. I, actually, I didn't have any choice. My, my parents moved to China when I was, I was 14 uh, and I, I was pushed into China studies uh, with, without any, any, any idea about what I was, I was doing. So I, I got involved in studying Chinese language first as an undergraduate and, and then getting into history uh, and looking uh, specifically on the early encounters between China and India as part of my master's studies at, at Peking University. So, so essentially I, I studied China in China uh, and, and that gave me a different perspective, which I actually realized when I went to University of Pennsylvania to do my PhD that I've been looking at China from a very different perspective. Uh, and what I was studying in the US uh, gave me another perspective. And now that I'm back in China, as you mentioned, I'm in Shanghai now, I'm getting a totally different perspective having been here for the last 30 so years going back and forth. So uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a fascinating to look at China and, and you're absolutely right. When I was actually studying China and Chinese history, Japan was the key issue uh, even within China. And, and, and that is what you have been working on. Your, your studies is not just about China, but it's also about, about Japan. And in your first book is on Manchuria. Uh, and then how do you focus on this issue of China and Japan? Because I do China and India, and you do the other side of, of China and, and Japan. Uh, and, and have you encountered in, in this relationship between China and Japan the issue of India? So I think one of the most interesting things, and perhaps one of the things most relevant to the present day, and actually to, I think, you know, I know, I know our viewers today are all around the world, but a lot of them will be in India, is the not quite triangular relationship, but certainly a very complex relationship between the three biggest countries of Asia, depending on whether you want to count population or economy size. There are a lot of other fantastic places, you know, Indonesia, Vietnam coming up rapidly. But, you know, India, Japan, China, let's just think about those for a, for a, for a moment. I think that one of the areas that is least understood is what these countries think about each other. And I'm going to give you a few thoughts on that, Tansen, but then, you know, sitting where you are in Shanghai, I'd love to, to have you, you know, reply sure. on, on, on that. So one of the things that most fascinated me recently was a survey, and actually it's available online, people can find it, done by the British Council and carried out by Ipsos Mori, which is a really respectable polling organisation. So these are, these are good statistics. And they surveyed a whole variety of middle-class Chinese people about what they thought about various countries. I just say, actually, just for a second to take it away from information, but you might be interested to know that um, France actually came top of the list with 85% favorability rate from China's uh, you know, middle-class interviewees. The UK came second. Uh, the oh. US is now quite a long way down the, uh, the, the, the line, but who knows what can change. But Japan, that was the one that fascinated me because the story that perhaps we tend to think of if we read the newspapers, you know, we're reasonably well informed, but don't look perhaps too much below the surface is China and Japan hate each other. They can't stand each other. You know, these countries have this awful long relationship. And let's be honest, there are some reasons why that might be the case. As you kindly mentioned, um, somehow I seem to have been attracted over and over again during my uh, life as a researcher to that, you know, often very fractious, often very violent relationship between China and Japan. So the first study I did, which was my PhD thesis at Cambridge under the supervision of the historian Hans van der Ven, was about the Manchuria crisis of the 1930s. Uh, and I wanted to look at it not as international relations, which is where it normally gets looked at, but as a grassroots thing. You know, if you're a, um, a kind of poor farmer living in this part of Northeast China, frozen territory in the winter, and suddenly, you know, this huge Japanese army in, invades and takes over, you know, what do people think about that? And the answers are often actually quite uncomfortable for nationalists because, of course, there are people who get on horseback and bravely resist. There are an awful lot of other people who just get on with their lives. So this made me realize that actually the relationship between these two highly nationalistic countries might be more ambiguous than perhaps uh, people realized. And then over time, I you know, came back and forth between different projects. But I was, you know, in, so, in some ways, actually having spent about 10 years of my life with a research team looking at the detail of China's Second World War, the, the war between China and Japan between 1937 and 1945, has been very uh, 
illuminating because it reminds me that actually this period, you know, the Second World War is a period of huge relevance to people all around the world in, in different ways. But I think China's contribution and China's understanding of how it changed their identity is something that's been in some ways un underplayed. So, you know, I could see that this was, was, was very important. And of course, the war crimes, the horrors, you know, the rape of Nanking being one of the most famous and horrific ones in 37, 38. These are the things that people tend to remember and they come up so often in the public discourse, particularly when the two sides are throwing rocks at each other. So when I looked at this British Council survey I've mentioned, I was really interested to see that actually the favorability rating amongst Chinese middle-class people towards Japan was pretty high, it was about 70%. And that I think says something else that yes, the history is not forgotten, but actually Japan's ability to innovate in technology Japan's the sense that you know when Chinese tourists go to Japan and when there isn't a kind of freeze between the two countries a lot of Chinese do do visit Japan that it's an organized society that it's got a very communitarian feel that it's well run you know all these sorts of things they are there too I have to say it doesn't run mutually because I think if I remember correctly the number for young Japanese and what they think or sorry middle class Japanese including the young and what they think of China is close to about 30 percent favorability so it's quite different just on a note to add India to the mix then one of the things that I think at the moment is in flux is what I, what I used to say, I'll tell you what I used to say maybe, you know, even two or three years ago, it's slightly rude towards our Indian friends, so I'm going to be careful when I say it, but I'll say it anyway, and I'm going to say it's changing, which is that when you compare what Indians and Chinese think about each other, Indians tend to fear China, and the Chinese don't really care very much about India. Now, that's a quite a naughty thing to say, but I'll, forget, I'll try and get myself forgiven by saying that actually I think that's changing. First of all, I think that India, I think there is still fear about China for a variety of reasons. And the whole Galwan incident, uh, the whole, I mean, incident, we're talking about deaths. I mean, you know, it's a serious, serious thing. And then, of course, you know, the debate, Huawei, should it be allowed into the Indian economy or not, you know, hasn't actually, I think, officially been banned, but I think the likelihood is pretty, pretty low. So, you know, the, the question of real caution is there. But also, I just get a sense more and more that India is thinking more in its institutions and its government, its universities about having to understand China as well. More people learning Chinese, more people going to study in China and actually drinking that in. And I do also have a sense, and I want to throw this back to, to you now, Tansen, because you're right there in, in China. And you, you tell us that actually India is being taken more seriously by China, not necessarily in sense of, of a kind of, I always thought this rather overwritten idea that India and China, two big countries, will become allies and take over the world. You know, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. But the sense that India is a major security actor, that it's a potential economic partner for a whole variety of things, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, this big kind of defense, security, trade organization, a bit, a bit shallow in some ways, but also wide ranging, and India and China both very much part of that. I see a new sort of seriousness about India amongst a lot of Chinese think tankers that, that I talk to. Does it seem that way to you? Yeah, uh, that's certainly true. I mean, it's not only the think tanks, the state itself, which is closely associated with many of the think tanks, uh, takes India seriously. I, th I think the, the previous argument that China does not take uh, India seriously is no longer true. I think they understand, yeah. uh, perhaps just has to do with a strong government in India itself, uh, nationalist, uh, it, it may be, but that, that has been the case for the last five, six years. And I see that. Uh, among uh, people who work in the think tanks and present issues uh, about uh, about India uh, in various conferences and workshops. But the more interesting uh, is, is the issue about, as, as you were pointing out, the grassroots. I think the grassroots uh, Chinese are also thinking about India very differently uh, than was the case when I came first to, to, to China in the 1980s. There is absolutely a huge interest in Bollywood. Uh, Amir Khan is very, very popular here. Uh, but also uh, Buddhism uh, is, is something that I have worked on previously. Uh, and these are Han uh, elite Buddhists who are quite interested in going to India and, and looking at India. Uh, there's also an interest among, uh, among travelers. Uh, uh, there are lots of uh, individual travelers uh, going to, to India uh, and, and writing about their experience. Uh, about going through different parts of India, looking at the spiritual aspect of, of, of India. So I, I think in different levels, there's a engagement with India and it may be a state engagement, a think tank engagement. What fascinates me coming to China is the common people, the grassroots engagement uh, with India, imagination of India, traveling to India, doing yoga 
uh, and I'm thinking about uh, yoga as one of the Indian contributions to contemporary uh, China is really fascinating. Uh, so I, I, I see that, um, but, but as you are pointing out, the, the surveys uh, point out that there is a generally a negative perception of, of India among the Chinese and the same with Indians having a negative perception uh, of, of China. I mean, this I think has to do with, uh, and then perhaps you can tell, tell us uh, if this is true between China and Japan, is lack of understanding. Still, there is a lack of understanding in India about China, about India in, 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 in China as well. So I don't know if, if that is true in the case of, of China and Japan. It's, it's the information that goes back and forth. I think there's a problem between India and China about this kind of information flow. So I think that question of information flow that you just brought up, that's a really good way to put it, because I think that that gets to the heart of one of the concepts that I think that Asia, broadly speaking, is going to have to think about when we move into the new um, you know, new era, whatever that is, that, that's already, already emerging, where Asia is you know, already a huge part of the economic beating heart of, of the world economy, and also in terms of a whole variety of security questions that have yet to be resolved. You know, if we think about the European Union, you know, the fact that Britain has just recently brexited and left the, the EU, I think it's beginning to make people realize that actually an awful lot of the kind of informal connections, the back and forth, the fact of, you know, kind of uh, business people, media, uh, politicians, just ordinary people kind of interacting with each other, ripping out a section of that actually, you know, creates a loss in terms of networks. Uh, in a weird way, Asia, of course, in some senses has been networked for centuries and Buddhism, which you know a great deal about, is you might regard it as lots of things, but it's also one of the great networking um, institutions, you might say, of, of, of the past uh, two millennia or, or, or more. But getting back to you know, how that, I think, affects the way that these countries think about each other today, there's never really been a network that enables Japan, China and India to talk to each other in that kind of very detailed, very engaged way that, say, you know, the North Atlantic countries, you know, even across the Atlantic with the United States and Northwest Europe, for a whole variety of reasons to do with the way in which essentially America took over Western Europe after World War II. And that's one of the things that my, my book, China's Good War, which was kind of mentioned at the beginning, tries to, to explain. The way I do it, is a concept, and I might throw it at you if I may, Tansen, and, and you know, see if I get your thoughts on this. It's a concept that I call circuit of memory. And what I mean by that is that actually, more than people understand, shared historical memory doesn't have to be good, it can be bad, but shared historical memory of events that brought people together into the same arena can actually have a very long afterlife in terms of the way that people think about uh, things. And I think, you know, in a sense, the whole history of post-war Europe has been about a shared circuit of memory that, you know, Second World War, horrific uh, fight against the, the evil of the Nazis, genocide, and then finally defeat of that and the installation of democracy and you know, liberal, liberal values. There are lots of hypocrisies and flaws in that story, but overall it's a recognizable one. That's not the story of post-World War II in Asia. It might have been in different circumstances, but because 1945, the end year of World War II, was followed by Indian independence, by Japan becoming essentially uh, a kind of, you know, um, alliance state of, of, of the US, and China having its communist revolution. The circuits of memory about World War II, the way in which these countries thought about their World War II experience, was never really shared. So Japan essentially was able to rewrite its story of itself as a country that, of course, had you know, done terrible wrong through its war in, uh, uh, in, in Asia, but had been essentially redeemed by being taken over by the Americans and turned into a liberal democracy, which, of course, you know, it is today. Japan is a free and democratic society, and occasional Chinese criticisms, that's not the case, I think, are not to be taken too seriously. India then, of course, had its own post-1947 independence story, which, to be honest, probably didn't draw very much on the wartime experience because it was about making a new start. And to me, most intriguingly of all, China, the country which, let's remember, during those World War II years, fought longer than any other allied power, eight years, uh, lost over 10 million, maybe as many as 14 million dead, civilian and military, uh, had 80 to 100 million of its own people become refugees, and of course held down over you know, half a million uh, troops, uh, Japanese troops, until the Allies came along four and a half years later at Pearl Harbor. Almost none of that was discussed 
during the era of Chairman Mao, because it involved something that we can now say in China, we know, but in the past was difficult to, to say, which was about the participation of the other side, the non-communists, the Guomindang nationalists of Chiang Kai-shek. And I know this is particularly relevant to where you're sitting now, uh, um, Tan Sen, because last year, uh, Chinese viewers will certainly know that there was this uh, movie, Ba Bai, The 800, massive hit. I don't know if you went to see it yourself, um, 300 million US dollars at the box office. Basically, a bunch of Chinese soldiers in World War II fighting to the last stand against the Japanese invaders in 1937. But of course, they're not communist soldiers. Yeah. They're nationalist soldiers. And the fact this movie was first actually banned for a while, but then released to great acclaim in, in China, shows, I think, the ambiguity about this story. So my final thought on this is this. Because I think that China, Japan, India have essentially been having very inwardly directed conversations about the legacy of that past since 19, uh, 1945. It's been much more difficult for them to see each other as part of that kind of network, that, 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 that nexus. And while I think there's beginning to be a greater sharing of some of that modern history, the wounds still run quite deep in certain ways. So I find myself wondering, and this is really a question for you as an expert, Tan Sen, can other things, can you to mention yoga, but can religious institutions, can Buddhism, can any other factor be found that might create new sorts of networks between the societies as they become richer, more powerful, and more of the world's center of gravity moves, moves towards them? Yeah, I, I, I'll answer it. Yes, there, there are possibilities. But uh, before I, I get into that, uh, when I was reading your book, I was reminded about the similarities uh, that you are writing about uh, China and, and Japan, war, memory, and changing narratives. Something similar is, uh, was happening or is happening between China and India with regard to the 62 war. Uh, you know, we have a, a Buddhist connections that is part of the memory and part of the narrative. But the, the narrative and the memory of the 62 war is quite different uh, in India and China. Uh, the Indians are, are aware of the 62 war. It's, it's played in, in, the, in the media. It's part of, of movies. Uh, that was not the case. Uh, I think that was a similar thing that we are pointing out with regard to the Mao period, uh, China-Japan relations. We're not aware of, of the 62 war. It did not matter that much, but that's coming back. You know, with, with, with what happened in, in Ladakh with the death of Chinese soldiers, uh, that memory and that narrative is, is being created. So I was wondering if there were comparisons to be made uh, between war, memory, narrative in the case of China-Japan relations and, and India-China uh, relations as well. I think that would be a fascinating way to compare how wars are perceived uh, seen, uh, narrated, uh, and, and the memory lingers on uh, in, in, in the uh, groups of people in both countries. Uh, I, I think it would be a fascinating comparison to be, to be made. Uh, but with regard to your question about are there new networks that can be created? Yes, I think they already exist. Uh, they need to be encouraged. I mean, there are about 10,000 uh, Indian students studying medicine in, in, in China. I mean, that's a fabulous number of people, uh, Indians who are now complaining that they can't come back to China because of COVID uh, yeah. and they want to get a degree from, from here. That's one network. I mean, 10,000 students in China, I mean, that didn't happen in the 80s. I remember there were only two Indian families outside the embassy in, in the 80s. Uh, but, you know, the things have changed. Uh, how do we use that network is the question, right? The Buddhist network is really fascinating. These are Han Chinese who practice Tibetan Buddhism and, and want to go on pilgrimage. They rent the luxury train uh, in Bihar and go about uh, to, uh, going around pilgrimage. Uh, individual travelers, I mean, these are the networks. Even the social media, I think, is, is a network that Indians and Chinese can really engage with each other. I think we should be promoting that. Uh, those networks exist. Uh, and we need to encourage them. I think that's, I mean, I think something similar may also exist between Chinese and, and Japanese, right? I mean, uh, various kinds of networks that are not state run, essentially. I, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, between China and Japan, you know, there's still a significant amount of educational interchange. And certainly for Chinese academics to go to Japan is still you know, pretty normal. Indeed, for you know, a certain number of Japanese academics to come to China as well. Um, there's often actually also a kind of shorthand that Chinese and Japanese use about each other, which is cold politics, hot economy. And it's worth noting that even at the worst time of uh, Chinese-Japanese relations, and even now, you know, the Japanese get understandably very angry about the fact that they 
their perception is well not perception the reality is that they're you know are kind of chinese coast guard vessels are around disputed islands you know the chinese obviously take a different view of this but you know japan's views i think are quite clear even when all that is going on they're still huge trade partners with each other just within the last few weeks we've seen for instance that some of the biggest japanese corporations like matsushita are investing further in the Japanese, uh, so the Chinese market. And in addition to that, of course, the signing off of institutions such as RCEP, the Regional Common uh, Economic Partnership, show that actually we can expect to some extent a deepening of the free trade relationships and other economic connections between the various factors. The big question, of course, and this is one of the things that you know really is, is both crucial and imponderable, is how far the various defense and security oriented uh, you know, issues, cautions, fears, let's be honest, between India, China and Japan may come up against the fact that these are three huge economies which also desperately want to do business with each other as well. And is it a question of either or, or can these two stories be integrated with uh, with each other in certain sorts of, uh, of, 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 of ways? I mean, as I've, as I've said, one of the ways that China these days is, I think, trying to define a more um, benevolent, uh, or at least one might get sort of morally morally positive um, definition of its own role in the region is by going back to, to 1945 and World War II. And the way they're doing it, and you hear this, I mean, most recently, I think last week, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi of China was giving a speech somewhere, uh, you know, intended for a foreign audience. And he used a line, which I keep hearing over and over again, and actually is discussed in my book, which is, you, meaning foreigners, should remember that China was the first signatory to the United Nations Charter back in 1945. In other words, China is saying to America in particular, look, you guys think that you invented the 1945 world order? Not at all. We were there as well. China was one of the first, you know, five countries that was, was part of that, along with the UK, France, and the Soviet Union. It was, of course, nationalist China, not communist China at that time, but we keep a little bit, you know, kind of careful about mentioning, mentioning that. But in terms of the, the narrative, the idea of the ownership, of that uh, institution. It is very important, I think, in contemporary Chinese minds. And also, I think there's sometimes a little element of pointing out, you know, obliquely to India and Japan that you may be very big, powerful countries, but you are not founder members of the United Nations or permanent five Security Council countries. Well, so there's a little bit of sort of subtle one-upmanship, I think, going on there as well. And this Second World War history is very much part of that. Ryan, let's get, we, we have uh, a couple of minutes before we ask the audience. Sure. I mean, audience, you can type in um, uh, your questions in the chat box. Please and, do. And, uh, both of us can answer your questions. But uh, the, the question that was raised as, as a panel, will China shape the future uh, of the world? Uh, before we get to the world, uh, do you think China will shape the future of Asia? You know, there was a discourse between Chinese Indians uh, and, and Japanese in Tokyo in the early 20th century where many Chinese intellectuals were engaging with Indians. That was a fascinating sure. period, I think, when all these three groups of intellectuals came together uh, about an Asian century, right? I mean, that has been emphasized over and over again, including the 1950s, it comes up again. But do you think China will shape the future of Asia before we get to the global part uh, with its Belt and Road Initiative? I think that, it will, but with one important exception. So it will shape it in the shape that, you know, economics is not the only power, but it's a very important power. And when you look at the trading relationship of pretty much every single country in the Asia Pacific region, I won't necessarily count India, uh, India at this point, um, you know, China is the major partner. And when we think about path dependency, so for instance, the fact that in so many countries in Southeast Asia um, and in South Asia too, actually, Huawei, ZTE, you know, big Chinese tech majors are being essentially given the contracts to provide the infrastructure. Once it's in, you know, you probably don't change that. It's very, as Britain is finding, which has decided to go against Huawei, you'd have to spend a lot of money to get it all out again. So, you know, these, these are decisions that have years, maybe even decades of, of significance. And by doing that, I think China is being quite shrewd in terms of the way in which it's looking to lay down the footprint. But there's one area. And I think it is one of the areas where China still continues to be really, really keen to try and win, and I think fails, is soft power. In other words, the idea, not that China is respected or that China, you know, is taken seriously because of its economic power, but that people feel that, you know, doing things the Chinese way is the way that we want to do that. And I think there are two reasons for that. You know, the first one is that 
China kind of wants to have it both ways. It's always saying that, you know, this great phrase uh, that you'll know uh, from, from childhood, I think, uh, Tan Sen, with Chinese characteristics. We do socialism, but with Chinese characteristics. We do, you know, culture, but with Chinese characteristics. And it's very difficult to tell people that you're doing something that's so distinctive that nobody who's, you know, not Chinese could get into it. But also it's for everyone. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to balance in that, uh, uh, in that sense. And also, to be honest, the top-down nature of Chinese politics and society at the moment is not always very attractive to the outside world. Places like Indonesia, free, lively, very turbulent democracies, of course they want Chinese tech. Of course, they want Chinese investment. Of course, they're very happy to have Chinese uh, tourists or business people. But to actually change society, which is in a form which they've fought for very hard for many, many years, to make it more like the very top down, you know, system in China, that is really not going to, uh, I think, be attractive in that um, uh, in that sense. So I think the ability of China to get itself respected in the world is, you know, a work in progress that's actually, I think, receiving quite a lot of success. The ability of China to be loved in the world, I think that so far this is a, a work that is much, much further behind in terms of, uh, of progress. Yeah, I don't know if you have seen Tim Winter's uh, book on, on Belt and Road Initiative where he coins this term heritage diplomacy uh, mm. and he argues that uh, China uses this heritage uh, diplomacy to smooth, it, smooth its uh, international image, uh, exactly what you are saying. The, it, it seems like it comes out as a hard power, but with the Belt and Road Initiative, he's arguing it's actually a heritage diplomacy where uh, uh, underwater archaeology and other things are, are being used uh, to essentially uh, smoother its, uh, uh, smooth its uh, image in an international arena. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I've not seen the particular book, but the idea is is one that I've I've you know clearly seen that, and also you see you know everything from big um, uh, exhibitions at museums, including the British Museum. And by the way, China deciding to actually send some of its great heritage to you know a big museum in in Bombay or uh, uh, in in Delhi or in Kolkata, uh, you know wherever it is, that that would I think be potentially a very interesting move. But overall, I think it's still looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Because where the soft power really comes from is not top down. It's not sort of government saying, yes, we will lend you our artifacts. It's about, you know, you mentioned Bollywood at the beginning. You know, Bollywood obviously is a huge industry and it's not unconnected with the official line on things sometimes. But, you know, it is a popular art form that has achieved success in India and around the world because people love it. Uh, you know, similarly, America, you know, back in the Cold War, blue jeans, rock and roll, Coca-Cola, all this sort of stuff. And also the feeling in all the places that have the biggest soft power, India, I think is, is you know, in many ways one of those, South Korea, Japan, um, actually countries like Britain, you know, the Beatles, whatever, and, uh, and the US, is that they have something a little bit kind of edgy, a little bit dangerous, a little bit turbulent, a little bit kind of letting it all go. That's what people, people often say, oh, we want kind of neat, nice order. And of course that's true in, in many cases, but because there's nothing rough at the edges about what China's offering, it's all about exhibitions. It's all about, you know, everything kind of neatly packaged with everything from the history to the politics, you know, being laid down the line. It's very impressive, but it doesn't create soft power. It just, it just doesn't. Yeah. But there's a, there's a question there which is relevant about coronavirus. So as, as you can read, uh, do you think the coronavirus has helped China uh, uh, with its, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think it means uh, help China with regard to its soft power uh, because of the early recovery and perhaps also for the vaccines. Uh, do you see that? I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has cut both ways for China. In terms of positives for China, after an initial series of really quite bad stumbles, it is clear, and you're sitting in Shanghai, so you tell me, Tan Sen, that in terms of domestic control of the virus, China seems to have done a pretty effective job, as long as it keeps its borders closed. And I think this is something that's going to be difficult over the long term, because, you know, China does need people coming in and out as a kind of global economy to succeed. And, you know, anywhere in the world, people are not going to sit for 14 days in a quarantine hotel before they can actually go to their three hour business meeting. So, you know, that's going to be, I think, a longer term problem. And it will take a while for the, the vaccine to roll out. In addition, you know, there's vaccine diplomacy that um, in places like the Middle East and elsewhere seems to have had a certain amount of, of success. But the downside, I think, and it, it's real, is that I think that there is a danger that this is going to close China off more in the medium term, because actually the kind of China that it seems that China wants to be, tech enabled, you know, genuinely global economy, 
cannot, I think, do that and literally sit behind, well, you know, essentially walls that have been built up because of the need to try and keep the outside world out. These are, in the end, I think, two incompatible aims. And in the end, there's some really, I think, tough decisions. Every country has to make them, but China, you know, is less transparent than most, perhaps, on them, on how much you open up and how much you say we've got this situation where the virus is stable and we can use vaccines to control it. I have a suspicion that the the, 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 the the weight might fall on the balance in a different place in China compared to, say, where it would in the United States or indeed even in, in India. But right now, it seems to me that decision is being deferred rather than being really clearly, clearly made. So I think the jury is kind of out on that part. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I came from the U.S. in August and I had to go through the 14 days of quarantine. Uh, and, and it is actually very nicely managed. I mean, uh, where you go, how many tests you have to do, and then you get out uh, of, of quarantine. Um, but they, they realize that uh, this can't continue. I mean, they have been allowing people to come back, especially people who do business, foreigners who do business uh, in China. And, and they have, in fact, also allowed NYU Sh Shanghai students, foreign students to come back. Uh, so as, as an experiment to see what happens with the spread of uh, coronavirus, uh, so they are controlling it and they realize that this control cannot last forever. At so some point, they have to open it up. Uh, and this issue with, with va vaccines as well, I think the, the issue is within China domestically that uh, very few people are actually taking the vaccines because coronavirus does not exist in, in China. So there's no fear uh, among, among the people here to get the vaccine as quickly as possible, unlike in the US or, or that, That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. The urgency perhaps feels less. <laughs> Yeah, and people think they are out of that that stage now, but uh, I think the government is taking steps to control uh, as much as possible, but they can't, as you point out, sustain this in the longer term. They would like to open up. Uh, there are some more questions. Uh, you want sure. to uh, take one of them? Uh, Nihari, do you believe that China's sensitivities arise from struggles getting back to the opium war? This is a national humiliation thing. Uh, and, and their mistrust against uh, Westerners. Basically. Yeah, let, let's answer that question because actually it speaks to, 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 to history and its importance in the present day. So I think the short answer question to the question is yes, absolutely. I think that this, and just for those who don't know, uh, a term that you heard perhaps more in the early 20th century, but still comes back even quite a bit today, is this idea that China suffered a uh, uh, hundred years of national humiliation between the opium wars of the 1830s and 40s through to the end of essentially World War II, a succession of invasions and occupations and basically uh, successful attempts by foreign imperial powers to constrain China, not to turn it into a full colony like India, but nonetheless make sure it did not have freedom of maneuver in the way that an independent country actually uh, would. And that's one of the reasons, again, that, you know, the World War II example that I, I talk about in, in, in China's Good War um, is so important because the Chinese themselves, and again, I think I'm quoting no less a figure than Xi Jinping himself, I think, said that, um, you know, the China's Second World War, the War of Resistance against Japan, as, it, as, it, as, as they would call it, um, was the first occasion where China took on a foreign invader in the modern era and won. And that's a really important distinction because of course the Opium War is a story about loss. The invasion of Manchuria, a story about loss. So all of these are examples of how the outside world in Chinese eyes, for good reasons, has been often a very hostile force. And yes, I think the frank answer is that it goes some way to explaining why official China still does tend to be very wary and talk in extremely kind of um, you know fierce terms about foreign in, uh, uh, interference, invasion, occupation. Now, I should say straight out at this point that I think a great deal of that is far too overwritten and that China also needs to think about the way that it presents itself to the world and understand that outside powers talking about how um, you know, China uh, ought to change in certain ways is not foreign interference. It's part of the natural discourse that global house have with each other. And if you don't believe me on that, then think about the way in which rightly the world talked to the United States about George Floyd in the horrific okay. killing there. And it was quite right that countries, including China, spoke out about that. So all of that, I think, is the way in which China has taken that humiliation from the past when it was weak, and in some ways is still using it even though now it's very far from weak, it's an extremely strong country in terms of economy, military, and security. Exactly, and, and, and I think this is for the domestic and international audiences. It's not just an international audience that they are using, sure. national humiliation narrative. The other, other question that is quite relevant here 
uh, is about India and China. Can they work together to mitigate the environmental issue? And, and perhaps even Japan joins in. Can India, China and Japan work together perhaps to mitigate this issue about environmental problems that we are facing? I think that the hope is greater now that President Biden has put the United States back into the Paris Climate Change Agreement because, and of course this year we have COP15, which China will host, and COP26, which the UK will host. So chance for two uh, countries, I think, to have some, some interesting dialogues. I think the chances have risen again because during that period under President Trump, when the US said, we're not interested in this, it gave the perfect excuse for other countries, India, China, Japan, and you know, plenty of others too, to say, well, if the US isn't going to do this, why on earth should we? Now that the US is back in, you know, the argument that actually this is something collective, even though China-US relations are not fantastically good at the moment, I think it does provide an opportunity because there is a selfish interest, uh, not, 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 nothing very altruistic about it, on the part of China and India in massively mitigating the effects of climate change. Ch you know, think about China's capital, Beijing. It's basically on the Gobi Desert. It is a city that is suffering greatly from the reality of climate change in China itself. India also suffering a huge number of climate, cha climate change issues that are going to affect farming, which of course is currently a very sensitive political issue in India, as you, as you might, uh, might say. Japan is you know, also a, a big polluter that needs to, to, to bring its levels down, but it's in a slightly different situation because Again, its demographics mean that in a sense, the Japanese economy, but slowly but surely, is going to shrink over time, over a bit longer time. So, of course, will China, since its demographics are going to change very much, uh, particularly in about 10 years from now onwards. But during that period, yes, I think it's, it's, it's inevitable that there will have to be serious conversations. And the fact that the US is back in the game, I think, is an important uh, shove in the direction of more cooperation. On, on that, that topic and bringing back the question we had, can China, by focusing on environmental issue, shape the future of, of the world? Potentially. I mean, in certain areas, including things like green technologies, solar technologies and so forth, there is, I think, a lot of actually very genuine attempts in terms of both technology and intention to address questions of climate change. China also needs to sort out some of the areas where it's um, it's basically cutting against that narrative in some flawed ways. For instance, on the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it is selling coal-fired power plants to Pakistan. This is not a green thing to do. And I'm sure that uh, Pakistan would be very happy to have some more of that actually very um, impressive Chinese green tech, even if it's rather more expensive to supply. So I think, you know, anomalies like that will have to be sorted out. But is there a role for that side of China's technology and intentions? Sure, of course. Okay. So we have about uh, three minutes left. I mean, is there anything that you want to bring up that we should be thinking about as China moves and, and, and creates a new future for all of yeah. us? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll give a brief reflection, but I want to leave enough time to, to, to get you know, your response to it as well, uh, uh, Tansen. So my, my, my feeling is that right now we are at a moment, and I say we meaning the entire world, where the rise of China and its meaning is still capable of more than one interpretation. And I think that China has a duty here. It's got to actually prove that it is a genuinely cooperative power that is interested in not just climate change, but also in areas where sometimes it will have to compromise, as a great power does, in areas like maritime and territorial disputes. So India, South China Sea, all these sorts of areas. We need to hear less of the wolf warrior rhetoric from China and more of the cooperative side of, uh, of, of, of these issues. Otherwise, China should not be surprised if the rest of the world becomes frightened and decides essentially to find ways to contain China. China. But the rewards for China to take the other path are very, very great. If it can find a way to move away from wolf warriorism and towards a genuinely more cooperative stance, then actually, you know, there is a very good argument. And someone kindly in the chat mentioned an article I've published in this month's Foreign Affairs magazine. Feel free to, to check that out. In, in, in which, you know, it is not possible for China simply to be defined by the wishes of its geopolitical rivals, so in particular the United States. It's not to say that those rivals are wrong or that they don't have their own rights, but that China, of course, has some right to self-definition as well. And I think China needs to get itself in a better position where it can actually have some sort of discourse that goes beyond rhetoric and language uh, to actually say, what it really wants to do in terms of hearing what the rest of the world says and engaging with it. Uh, my final thought is that too often China's language about itself in the world goes from very saccharine to very shrill and it needs to find a spot in the middle which so far it has failed to do but it is capable 
of doing so. Uh, but how, how does it seem to you, Tansen? Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with this. I think the wolf, wolf warrior mentality is, is being a problem um, when the diplomats taking on to the tutor and, and creating lots of problems and creating this image that China is still a threat is, is very problematic. And then they have, as you're pointing out, means to not do that. And, and, and uh, I mean, even the Belt and Road Initiative can be worked out in a way in which it is so for so called win win for all the sides uh, and i think that is something for for the chinese government to think uh, deeply and, and see how they can manage uh, the rhetoric uh, and and then help others which i mean they are pra- perhaps trying to do in africa uh, and, and and try to come up with a different kind of not only practical things but also a narrative that should be uh, soft rather than hard and i think that balancing of of narrative is something uh, that needs to be worked out by the Chinese government. Uh, and I, I think that's that's where perhaps we should say that they have, the future is perhaps more optimistic uh, if they are able to uh, to come to that terms. Uh, and perhaps you would agree with that. Uh, let, let, would, let's hope so. Let's hope okay. so. So I would thank uh, you, Rana, for, for this conversation. And I think we should have more of these conversations that would link uh, China, India, and Japan. So thank you very much. And thank you to the Jepulit Festival as well, those of us who helped. Uh, have this conversation between Rana and me. Thanks very much, everyone. Great to have you here. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Rana and Tansen, for that enlightening and relevant conversation. We'd also like to thank our official magazine partner, The Week, and our celebration partner, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and being such a supportive audience. Do stay logged on with us to watch other sessions that we've specially curated for you. Do also remember to pick up your copy of the book from the Amazon online bookstore. And if you are in the mood for some retail therapy, do check out our merchandise partners, Earth Fables. Please do tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Detol. We hope to see you soon. To all storytellers and story lovers, my name is Lakshtata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here. English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second. And tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app.